Hey everybody, this is Pete A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions, host and executive producer of the Break It Down Show. Man, do we have a fantastic episode to close out the week here. Our guest is named Vanessa Otero. She's a patent attorney from Denver, Colorado. She's educated at UCLA. Just and super, super smart. Okay. She here's what she's done. She's created this powerful assessment tool that looks at news media and gives you an idea of where they are in terms of credibility, political lean, and sort of plots them on a map. Now you've seen a lot of these things. Here's why this one's a little bit different. One, she's got a panel of people across a variety of political settings. And they all sort of self-check each other. They also look at a given story and how it is represented within that publication's lean and and legitimacy so something like breitbart is less reliable and pretty extremely you know far to the right not alt right but pretty far to the right where on the other side i just learned this today slate is comparably aligned but on the left side where you're like eh, you know more opinion based and not all that you know tight with the accuracy at least not as as much as reuters or ap which are top dead center super accurate very little lean in either direction and story to story you see a very small pattern whereas the other other publications tend to be looser it's just fascinating stuff my co-host is my former commander from bosnia he he ran all of us spies and he said look vanessa's tool is interesting because yeah of course you can find out for yourself what kind of news you're reading but also you can understand your adversaries better because he's a, he's an intelligence guy he's a spy master right so he's always thinking how do you evaluate the information that's out there what is your opponent thinking and and how do we counter that because that's what counterintelligence folks do so i think you're going to find this to be a very fascinating conversation if you're like me at all i'm just frustrated with the media and the amount of spin and lean and all these things. And Vanessa just comes straight at it. And I, I think this is really going to be a fantastic episode that you guys are going to enjoy. Her company is called Adfontes Media, A-D-F-O-N-T-E-S Media.com, Adfontes Media.com. And their vision is to simply to help people. And we want to help they want to help people navigate the news landscape and contribute to a healthy democracy. Well, I'm all in for that. Let's do a little bit of business here. So obviously, get shirts, rate the show, review the show, subscribe to the show, convince a friend to subscribe. All of these things help us out. Even if you just text or, or email or, or just check in with me, that all helps. The more action there is, but the best thing is sharing. If you share, it helps the computer go, hey, this thing's being shared. This thing is important. I do my best to get them out there. I know that the uh, the threads are always battling against us, but that's really what it would be awesome is if you guys could share this episode, especially this one, because it is it doesn't focus on partisanship. It does help us understand what we're reading and what our friends are reading. So we can all say, huh, this is interesting. Same story, totally different approach to it. As always, savethebrave.org. I would love to you guys to do a monthly subscription and just pay 10, 15, 25 bucks. You hear me say it all the time. That's because it's important. We're out there trying to save lives and building and doing bigger and bigger things all the time. We're really going somewhere special. Help be part of it. Help us out. All right, enough of me talking. Let's let Vanessa talk for a little bit. Here comes Vanessa Otero. Lions Rock Productions. <laughs> This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morata. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, this is Vanessa Otero with Ad Fontes Media, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. This is one of those shows that uh, my former commander, Eric Kleinsmith, has uh, asked me to do, and I, I love it. And it's so timely. We're talking with Vanessa, and one of the things that she does at adfontesmedia.com is they evaluate media sources. Gosh, given the headlines from the uh, Baghdadi you know, killing the other day when we, when we got that guy, uh, some of the very questionable headlines make you wonder, like, who can we trust? Who can we read? And you can all look at adfontesmedia.com. I'll put that in the show notes. And you can see, like, the first thing they do is start laying down 
you know, who's reliable, who does complex analysis well. All these things are in there. So, hey, first off, thanks for coming on. And Eric, thanks for setting this up. I'm going to get out of the way and let Eric kind of talk to you a little bit. Hey, this is P. Day Turner from the Break It Down Show checking in real quick to ask you this. John, Scott, and I all support Save the Brave with our time, our location, our effort, and our money. Each month, we give a small amount. Do the same with us. Go to savethebrave.org. Click on the Donate tab, pick an amount that you want to come out each month, and they will handle all the rest. I stand behind these folks. Thank you so much. Let's get back to the show. Kind of talk to you a little bit. Oh, no problem. Um, Then this is actually the the first time I've talked to Vanessa, although we've been going back and forth on email and a couple other things uh, well over a year. Yeah. Um, And so just to to give you a quick uh, background on how I I ran into her is that um, you know, my last tour active duty, Pete, after you and I were together, is I, I worked at an, uh, part of the Army called the Land Information Warfare Activity. And it was all about the military getting into the information warfare business, including deception, psyops, public affairs, uh, electronic warfare, jamming, all, all kinds of you know, cyber warfare, everything. And w- after leaving the military, it was, you know, kind of like, well, okay, that's not, not the military thing. I'm going to put that behind me. And so, you know, concentrated on doing a lot of intel stuff. But as I got to more and more working, doing the study, work, working training for the Army and, and, and looking at different pieces, open source intelligence became incredibly important and finding more and more that the, the uh, I want to say the war, uh, you can say it against, against information or war on information is, is, is leaving just the purview of the military and, and the government and is now seeping into every part of our life. And so... Uh, there's more and more I'm finding myself questioning the veracity of sources, the truthfulness, the timing of it, the, you know, not just, you know, the, the confirmation bias that is put out or, you know, or different kinds of biases and misperceptions. That, and so as I started doing research on this and writing several articles about fake news and, you know, when that all started and what fake news really means and what, is, you know, again, very short definition is it's propaganda. Um, it's, I, I ran into this chart online created by Vanessa Otero, and I was totally blown away by it because here's somebody who is not, you know, from the intelligence community. It, is, it was not her you know, job for a commander or a director or some agency to evaluate sources that, that, you know, intel folks have to do every day, all day. Right. And yet got it nailed on how to look at open source, you know, open sources that we're accustomed to every day that we get, you know, 99% of our information from. And and yet, you know, we still go to the same sources without understanding that there's an entirely different viewpoint or there's stuff that's just out there that they're they're no longer there to inform. They're there to persuade. And that becomes a big piece. And so that's why I, I reached out to Vanessa directly so I could include her chart in one of the articles that I wrote from my school at the American Military University. And I wrote it specifically on fake news as a guide for intelligence analysts on how to evaluate open sources. And I liked it so much, and she's been doing different versions of it, that I decided to include it in the, the book I got coming out on intelligence operations. Um, comes out December 2nd. And it's in the chapter about uh, data and information and knowledge and how those transform to each other and, and how to take a look at the different sources that you're, uh, that you're bringing in, whether it's classified or unclassified. But then this is, you know, this is a great chart to, to put in there. And this is a, you know, an academic book, so it needs to be in there as, as a point of learning. And so that's why I reached out to Vanessa. And that's, I mean, really, because this is the first time I talked to her, I really wanted to get, you know, Vanessa, just throw a question out to you is what, you know, what started you along this path to put this together? You know, it was actually a hobby. I'm a, I'm a really big nerd that analyzing the news is a <laughs> hobby, but I'm a patent attorney by profession still. And in the run-up to the 2016 election, I was just sort of alarmed about the kind of news sources that people would share on social media because, you know, people would argue with each other and often they'd post a link to support their viewpoint, but uh, not realize that the th- link that they were posting was going to be completely unpersuasive to anybody except for people who already agreed with them right. because it'd be just highly biased or just very opinionated and polarizing. And that was just a lot of the stuff that people were sharing on social media. And you could 
the conversation about echo chambers and filter bubbles was coming to the surface around that time. And I thought, you know, there's got to be a way to visually depict this, uh, how there are some news sources that are better, some that are worse, some that are left and right, but there's different degrees and variations of how you know good or bad something is, and there's different reasons why, and there's, uh, there's things that can just be a little left or a little right, and they're you know, you know, fine opinions, but then there are things that are very extreme. So, you, you know, the media landscape is a complex thing, but as a patent attorney, Part of my job is to take complex ideas and explain them in words and pictures. And you know, ten thousand words can certainly convey an idea, but uh, one picture or a couple of pictures can convey that uh, sometimes much more, more easily. So I just put it together on my uh, patent drawing software. <laughs> I use Microsoft Visio for that, and I, I put it online and was shocked to see it go viral. Hmm. And even more shocked that people from the uh, academic community, journalism community, uh, intel community uh, reached out and would ask me about my data and methodology and how I came up with this. And at first it was just, it was really just me, you know, with my analysis and my own methodology in my head. But over time, over the last three years, I've uh, put it out on paper uh, and, it, and added more sources, uh, come up with other versions. And within the last year, have uh, incorporated other analysts with different political points of view to help me analyze a larger, much larger data set and do it in a much more uh, streamlined and rigorous fashion. So now what we've got is the chart, this media bias chart, which is a two-dimensional taxonomy of how to categorize news. And we have a methodology for how we systematically place sources on that chart. How much does a story, a given news story from a cycle, impact somebody? I mean, it looks like the AP and Reuters, like we would expect, are just right down the middle, reliable news. But, you know, we have this whole um, we have this whole impeachment story, you know, and they're breaking mm-hmm. a story about an army colonel and all that. And, mm-hmm. and it's like all of the news is in different directions. So does a story like this mm-hmm. where, I, I don't know, let's just say the New York Times, um, you know, because they're a standard bearer. Does this story potentially move them to the left, to, to less reliable, up to more reliable in, in a significant fashion? Or does it take more than one story to do that? Well, for the sources that are on the chart right now, you know, we've analyzed it uh, usually at least at least 10 stories. It's not a huge sample, but for the bigger sources like uh, Washington Post and New York Times, it's uh, well over 75 stories each. And so it's a it's much, much bigger sample. And that's kind of important because how people usually talk about the news and evaluating things like bias and opinion and credibility is usually on an ad hoc basis. They'll see an example that's a bad example and they'll say, oh, see this article from the New York Times is very left-leaning, it's very opinionated, therefore the whole news source is like that. And people will say that with things like Fox News too, because uh, often your critics will view the, you know, the worst things uh, of the day that happen on Fox News. But when you, if you actually look at our interactive media bias chart uh, at adfontesmedia.com, you will see that we rank these on an article by article and show by show basis, which is super important. Uh, and we, our overall ranking is an aggregate weighted ranking of the articles that we ranked. So you'll see, you know, a uh, the New York Times in exactly where that is, but then you'll see a bunch of of dots that are a scatter plot showing that you know there are a bunch of stories that are fact based and quite neutral, and then there are the left leaning opinion stories, and there are right leaning op- opinion columns as well. So it's a uh, it's an aggregate rating. But you know, you mentioned at the beginning of the show this al Baghdadi story, and that's that was really fascinating to look at across the spectrum. So we we have this uh, this new uh, practice that we do which is that every week our analysts at AdFontes Media will rate six articles that are from across the spectrum about the same news story. And when we go and go and pick these, it's really, really fascinating. And this week we actually picked the al-Baghdadi reporting story because there's just a lot of things that you could focus on about that. And the coverage from left to right varied uh, greatly. And the coverage from, you know, 
low to high in terms of reliability very greatly as well. So, I mean, all the way on the left, you'd have stories that uh, would say, uh, actually, Trump messed this up and he it, it was totally terrible. And uh, and he staged this photo op or whatever. And then on the right, it'll say, this is the best thing that's ever happened. This is even more important than bin Laden. And by the way, it makes all of the Democrats in the primary look like children, you know? So there was such a huge difference uh, in, in what you could focus on, uh, what you could uh, spin. And it's really, it really has a dramatic impact on our polarization as a society. If you're just reading stories from one of those extremes, you know, it's really easy to just get locked in this world where, um, you know, that's all you believe and uh, that's the truth to you. Uh, reading from across the spectrum is a, is a great practice that I highly encourage because you get to see how, you know, different parts of the country, uh, you know, live and believe and react based on the content that they consume. Well, one of the things, and just, and again, just to describe this, this chart uh, for listeners, uh, we are looking at a, a two dimensional graph and it's really, once you line up all of these sources, they really kind of form a bell curve so that the, 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 you know, obviously the, the far left and the far right on either side, but then the up or down or the, or the Y axis is rating them, uh, these different news sources and individual stories if, for, for each source um, based upon whether they're less reliable or more reliable in terms of original fact reporting or it just contains complete fabrications or misleading content or, or, or things like that. And so that's what you get is in the aggregate is a, is a bell curve of all the different sources. But even going further, there's so many possibilities for analysis that can be done, especially in, in, in my world, where just as and Vanessa, I was just thinking about one and Vanessa already mentioned is that you can take a single story and then map where everyone is on that, you know, where every different source came in on that one story, whether it's Al Baghdadi mm -hmm. or, or whatever. And, and it, and it mm -hmm. harkens me back to when Pete and I, you and I were in Bosnia, we ran this, this newspaper called the Night Owl. Oh, yeah. Which was the, you know, we had soldiers working it. We hired local Bosnian teenagers to come in and we would just give them newspapers every day and they would just translate these newspapers so that when the, the different commanders or, and, or whoever in the, in the task force would come in in the morning, they'd have this, this is what all the local papers are saying, but they'd have to form their own opinion on that. And so this is such a much more dynamic way. I mean, besides... I don't, we we haven't got into bringing it into the classroom and how fantastic this could be for that. But um, but the other piece then is you can take a single a, an event that occurred and just say, look, this is where everybody's tracking it. This is where the stories are coming in. And and I know it's and, and I know like if, if you're just looking at it from a casual, I want to listen to the news. I don't want opinion or bias or anything like that. For Intel folks, you want to go to those fringe parts. Those are incredibly mm -hmm. important to look at uh, because you're still going to get just pieces of information that are, you're not going to get anywhere else. And the best example I have is we were doing, when we were doing the able danger program and we were hunting Al Qaeda prior to nine 11, we came, we were doing data mining, uh, but we weren't, we weren't really able to, the you know, internet wasn't really old enough for us to get overwhelmed with the amount of news sources. So we were bringing in stuff from bloggers and things like that. And we found a website that said that, uh, Al Qaeda was operating in the Maghreb part of Africa or North Africa using a car dealership to funnel to, as a front organization to funnel money in and out of it. Great tip, or, uh, tip and cue for other information if we were able to, to corroborate that. But when we finally showed that to another agency, I don't want to mention any names, but its initials are FBI, that what they, they asked us, like, all right, what was your source for this? And we, look, we showed them the source and it was this Michigan militia conspiracy theorist website that was absolutely spot on. They probably had no idea they were spot on on this one story. But then they had all this other crazy stuff like the, the FBI was sneaking the KGB in the northern Michigan and arming them with, uh, with caches of, of explosive and weapons. And Chelsea Clinton's real father was Webster Hubble. I mean, it was just off the wall. And the FBI just dismissed the whole line. Uh, that we were looking at because of the original source, even though we found all this other corroborating evidence that said, for whatever reason, these guys are nuts, but they were spot on in this one area. 
this chart helps you explain that and show your math much more easily. So that's my, I'm already giving you an ad for it. This is just the, the fantastic <laughs> way to take a look at it. So. It's interesting that you, uh, that you mentioned uh, a source that's typically very unreliable, but has a, um, you know, has a good, you know, actual real spot on story. Uh, and that, that's actually an insidious way that some of these very, very poor, uh, poor reliability, uh, highly polarizing sites um, mm -hmm. often will use as a tactic on purpose. You said these guys didn't know uh, that they had stumbled across something that was accurate, but right. um, it's the whole, uh, you know, uh, broken clock is right twice a day type of right. thing. Um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, the, it's funny how people will take it, low quality sites will often take credit for uh, outlandish predictions because they'll just publish anything. Like National Enquirer years oh, right. ago got, um, you know, they actually broke the John Edwards affair story, right? That's right. That's and right. they were like, see, we're, we're real news. Look at this real <laughs> right. news that we right. broke. <laughs> I mean, forget the 90% of the stuff that's just terrible right. um, that because they have like, no standards for Elvis is living standards. in Brazil next to Hitler and exactly you know, just... but that that happens on a um on a more regular basis on things that are higher up on the chart and that again is is really insidious because I'll get very ardent defenders of Infowars which is is so egregiously terrible mm -hmm. that it has been kicked off of Facebook and Twitter and you just have to be so terrible to get kicked off of those platforms um, but even with all the stories of uh, you know lizard people living on the moon and like the Sandy Hook uh, you know being like fake you know that horrible uh, series of uh, that horrible series of stories that they ran, Right. People say, well, you know, I know it's sometimes a little out there, but he has some good stuff, too. And that tricks people when mm -hmm. they, they have just enough. They're not 100 percent fake news. They, they have enough um, real stories to maintain some kind of credibility and some kind of plausibility. And those are the kinds of uh, those are the kinds of news sources that it's really important to rank on an article by article basis, because those are the ones that will you know, radicalize people and like bring them further right. down the ra rabbit hole and take them even farther to the fringes because you can start with something that's just, you know, it, uh, on our chart, we have a, you know, a skews left, skews right category. And then we have a hyper partisan hi mm -hmm. um, left and right category. And, and then the, the most uh, outside category is most extreme. It's the stuff in the hyper partisan categories I think is most insidious and dangerous because it's the most polarizing and it just kind of primes people to go down the rabbit hole and accept things that are more false than mm. than that right and that's and part of the reason again is is you know even though you see somebody you, you'll see a story that is that is completely biased the important piece from you know from any kind of intel or security standpoint is you still need to read those because mm -hmm. those are the persuasive stories you know, fo folks will, will listen to persuasion much easier than to listen to facts and make up their own minds. And it, why is because we just don't have enough time. You know, mm -hmm. Nobody. And I just had a, a discussion on Facebook with a friend of mine from high school. One of the things she she came she put out was a story that was it was she admit, blatantly took she didn't do it on purpose. She just didn't know. And it was a blatantly biased article, and I think it was something about Mackinac Island and and the, the use of automobiles. In fact, that. Um, I think the vice president had a motorcade on this island um, that no, you know normally you're not allowed to have a vehicle there. Well, that's just for security purposes. That's they got a, they got all kinds of reasons and they never de degrade their security. But the way the article was written was just way way off base. And and so she, in the discussions, the first thing she says is like, well, where can we go for an honest source? And my answer is really like you can't, you know, and, and you just don't have people don't have the time. To sit there and, and read their news and do it a, a skeptical, you know, critical thinking of, of every piece is much easier to go to a place that, that you know and you understand. Like, okay, I get this, I understand it, I believe it, and then just go on with their day. This model helps you to shatter that and helps you come up with a path that says, look, I need to look at these other areas. I intentionally need to go into some other areas that I'm not used to to see what they're saying. And then even from an intel standpoint, is you know especially if you're looking at foreign countries that you got to look at the hyperbolic media because that's what's driving 
the perception of whatever operation is taking place or whatever their viewpoint is of the U.S. involvement in, you know, whatever. So that's why I say it's, it's incredibly important to go out to those areas, even though you may totally disagree with what you're reading. Yeah. And, you know, the the question that people say, well, what news source can I just I go to and trust all the time? Uh, that's a that's a tough one because right. people will say if you give them a example of a reputable news source, and it doesn't matter who it is, NPR, AP, Reuters, Washington Post, uh, LA Times, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, mm -hmm. you know, everyone can give an example of a uh, time that one of those sources messed up. And, and people will e easily just throw their hands up in the air and say, well, then I can't trust anybody. And that's not true. <laughs> Because what we can rely on is, especially in the United States, uh, we're fortunate to have this because we have freedom of the press, is that we can rely on the media ecosystem. We have a very robust media ecosystem. And the reason we find out and we know that sources make mistakes is because these reputable sources first will admit when they uh, find out they make a mistake or when somebody else finds out they make a right. mistake. And their peers in the industry have incentives to point out the mistakes of others. They have a they have incentives to go and say, you know, try to re-verify something that another outlet broke because you know if they find out that that wasn't true, they've got they've got a big scoop, right? right. So and then they'll rush to print it, and um, you know that that's one way in which they compete with each other. So if there if there's a story that you're unsure about, you can easily read across six to eight very reputable publications and come to uh, a, a pretty good sense of what the truth is. Um, but reading across the spectrum is not only important for you know those very reputable sources. It is, like you say, really important to look at uh, what's going on in the lower quality and, and the fringes. And so the... Um, the exercise that I, I told you about that our analysts do every single week. Uh, so this week it was about al-Baghdadi stories. Last week it was about a story where um, the California governor, Gavin Newsom, he, uh, he pardoned he pardoned three uh, immigrants who had um, you know criminal records because uh, it was going to help in their deportation cases because they were from a long time ago. And, uh, you know, you can imagine there's a lot of political, different political takes on that one. Mm -hmm. uh, the week before, it was about the uh, CNN LGBT town hall for the Democratic primary candidates. Uh, the reason that we do that, uh, one of the reasons we do that is because uh, we, ha we now have a media literacy software platform form that we just launched and make available to uh, students in classrooms where they can evaluate those same news articles that we pick and compare them to our analyst ratings. So they can go through the process of reading across the spectrum, go through the methodology of how we actually rank these sources on our chart and learn those critical thinking sk skills themselves. Mm. So when you guys are working your chart, uh, you know, there's many of you to kind of check each other. You have a sense for, you know, I'm middle right, I'm middle left, whatever it is. But then you mm -hmm. actually get in there and start analyzing things. Do you find mm -hmm. out what your sense of your your sense of position is? Does it change? Is, does it evolve? Do you Are you able to accurately do that and then wait for your bias at all? Or how does that work? Yeah, so we have a couple of ways of, of measuring that. Uh, when we first started, uh, we had everyone fill out these self-rating spreadsheets uh, to evaluate their own political leanings. And, you know, people's political leanings are complex. It's not just left and right. I mean, people have different nuanced views on different political issues. And uh, especially people who are very, you know, politically involved and astute. So we broke it down into 20 issues and had people rank themselves from you know most extreme left to most extreme right on those and then come up with an overall aggregate uh, rating hey this is pa turner from lions rock productions we create podcasts around here and if you your brand or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast just talk to me i'll give you the advice on the right gear the best plan and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you that's sustainable that's scalable and fun hit me up at pete at breakdownshow.com let me help i want to hear about it aggregate uh, rating we balanced our groups based on that uh on, on what people self-rating uh you know the, what their self-rating was 
in terms of, you know, were they very left, very right, somewhat left, somewhat right, or some version of uh, center. And after, but after the fact, we also did some additional analysis to make sure we adjusted for if people were consistently rating things on their side as higher reliability as compared mm -hmm. to the average over time. Because you can see that, right? Like yeah. if you're right leaning right. and you read something that's right leaning, you just tend to give it more credibility. And if you're left leaning, you read something left leaning, then you give it more credibility. But what was interesting when we first did this on a large scale over this past summer was that we found that on an article by article basis, the deviations between a left leaning person and a right leaning person were really not that much. I mean, Ooh they're within they're usually within one category of, of each other so and it makes sense if you think about it like if you get really general like you want to say you know cnn is terrible or fox news is terrible i mean cnn and fox news are these enormous organizations that put out just hours and hours and uh you know millions of words of content every day so to, to talk about it on that high general level is difficult. But if you, you know, point two people of different political leanings to the same article, say you're looking at a very left-leaning uh, opinion article, a person on the left can look at that and say, this is left-leaning opinion. A person on the right will also look at that and say, this is left-leaning opinion. They'll agree to a very high, uh, high degree of certainty, which is amazing. And that's why we... Uh, that's why we break it down on an article by article basis. And then what's news and what's opinion? I mean, obviously an editorial piece is mm -hmm. opinion, but a lot of times people write news about news. Mm -hmm. Right. That's, I think, the most important distinction in our taxonomy because people, they'll put it in this binary of news versus opinion, and it's more complex than that. So we have a like a one to five scale of uh, fact analysis and opinion. So I know those are three things, but we go. So one would be fact. Uh, something's rated as a, a, a fact, a factual statement, just stated as fact, expressed as fact. Uh, two would be it's expressed as fact with some uh, some analysis. So analysis. What we're talking about analysis here is conclusions. Now, uh, three on our scale would be analysis. So it would be you know, tying the facts to conclusions. And then four would be analysis with opinion. Then five would be opinion. So the difference being that at the very bottom, your opinions are just conclusions without, uh, that are not very well tied to facts and are generally disputed, right? Like if you say something like, um, you know, government corruption is absolute. Well, is that is that true or false? I mean, you can make lots of cases for it. That's kind of, you know, disputable, right? But it's a conclusion and it's not uh, tied to any facts. But if you wanted to make a case that like, there's a lot of government corruption in, you know, whatever, whatever country, you could make that into analysis. It'd be ranked higher by laying out, you know, a uh, fact, a fact, a fact, a fact, a fact, and then a conclusion, right? So if you have an article about something uh, that just happened, it's like a who, what, when, where, why story. You know, there was a fire, for example. Like this is uh, this is where the fire is happening in, in what part of California, and this is uh, where the, it was reported to be started, and this is how much uh, it has been contained, and this uh, is what the weather is going to be like tomorrow. You know, that's just a list of facts. So that's uh, that would be ranked one in our as far as expression. Uh, but then if, but, you know, the things that, the things that move it down the, the scale from fact to analysis and opinion is the degree to which the you know, facts are prominent in the article. You know, the more opinionated pieces will just be more conclusory and less tied to facts. And the analysis stuff in the middle will be, you know, have some a balance of facts with conclusions that are supported by those facts. So, you know, it's really a gradient and people are not used to evaluating news on that gradient. They're just, you know, they kind of have this, uh, you know, binary, this dichotomy of news versus opinion where it's a lot more nuanced than that. 
have have you run across i mean i i mean you've been doing this for quite a while but have you run across a, a given story that was just kind of i guess really surprising of how it laid out with the different sources if, you, if you've been doing this week by week um you know one thing that's su surprising is that when you uh, based on the topic, you won't get coverage in some quarters on, on certain things. So, for example, this the story about uh, you know Gavin Newsom pardoning immigrants because of uh, so they were less likely to be deported in their deportation hearings. There, I, I looked uh, across the spectrum. Then this was this wasn't a huge story, granted, uh, n nationwide, but uh, it was reported by you know, like AP and Political. Go and that was that was a fairly those were fairly fairly neutral treatments of it, but it was really picked up a lot in right leaning right leaning media, right. and you know like Fox actually treated it kind of, uh, quite fairly, uh, you know so it skewed right, but it was still you know quite fair and, and factually based. But then there were a, a few outlets just on the lower right quadrant that really picked it up and were like you know, using it to like kind of incite anger about immigrants. But there were no corresponding articles on the bottom left saying, you know what, this is the greatest thing ever that Gavin Newsom has ever done. And we should pardon more, um, uh, more crimes, right? There wasn't like that. Hmm. There wasn't that extreme trade off. Right. And so, yeah, the, the coverage gaps are the most surprising I thing. think I think what you and what you're touching on is a is another form of bias, and it's just it's biased by omission. Absolutely. Whereas, and and that's part you know it, it's something to consider. It's like if you've got a, something that's not favorable to your mm -hmm. viewpoint of the world, then and, and even and this is it happens in the large organizations because it may be you may be a hot reporter that's 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 doing all the research on this, and it gets up to the editor, and the editor says that's not newsworthy. Well, well, why? I think it is like, no, not to me. And, they don't, and you know, that's just how it works. So mm -hmm. you eat from the, from the, I want to say from the smaller blogger, blogosphere and, you know, the, the more, I want to say fast and loose types of, of news organizations that are, or, or even the aggregate sites that are putting stuff up there. Yeah. You'll see some of the bias by omission, but it's, it's still present in the larger ones. Like, like, we're just not going to cover this. Why? Because it makes our guy look bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody's going to say that, but that's just sure. the way it is. So it's just, I mean, I, I'm amazed. That's interesting that, again, this chart can, can pick that out and you could and probably quantify that along the lines in the same manner. Yeah. I mean, bias by omission is, is a huge thing. And that's kind of why this is hard to measure because if you're trying to measure what's not in, what's not in a paper or an article, you have to know what, could, what should be in it and you have to read other sources to find that out. Some of this stuff, so I mean, looking at this like an intel guy who's going to be on the ground and be a reporter, right? Like my unique access is, you know, my job is to get things you can't find out otherwise. And so I write a report. It's like writing the news. And when I read other people's reports, I can see the holes. Even if I'm not on their patrol, I can see the holes in their story because of, of things they've missed, right? Because it's really easy to ask the wrong questions in the wrong sequence. And... um you, if they start to spin things, a lot of adverbs start showing up and a lot more adjectives that aren't really necessary. Like, you know, an Intel report should be pretty, should be pretty simple language so that anybody can pick it up and read it and understand it. So uh, at least by my style, short sentences and that kind of thing. But do you get a sense for that too, where you see like th this, this person just isn't competent enough to be doing this, uh, you know, complex story or, or, presenting this thing they just don't have the uh, the chops to get the information out yeah i mean when you when you look into the you know analysis opinion um you know market of news you know right now that floods our media landscape at the moment it's really expensive to produce good journalism because you have to pay people to be on the ground finding it out and uh, talking to primary sources and digging through documents and, and then writing it up and editing it and fact checking it. I mean, there's so much that goes on with real journalism, but there it's really easy to put up an analysis and opinion website, right? Mm -hmm. And you can have you know five staffers or twelve staffers uh, and who are just writers that are writing opinion and analysis and uh, just writing about 
the news. Like you said before, they're writing news, but it's about the news. And that's uh, cheaper to produce. And it's it, one of the ways that uh, they're incentivized to drive engagement is by using the things that you mentioned, like adjectives and adverbs, and you're making them more into opinion pieces because you know those are the things that are more polarizing. Those are the things that drive uh, clicks and views. And so, unfortunately, we've got so much of this what I call junk news. And I mean, so, you know, some there's some opinion and analysis that's very worthwhile. It helps us understand our world. I mean, you look at this is like the guardian atlantic economist you know there are some really great analysis that are important however you know, there's so much more of it that's just analysis and you see this uh you know i think the cable news uh channels are the most guilty of this because they have these incredible resources to actually you know they could be sending reporters across the world and have them be on the ground reporting things that uh, we would never otherwise hear about because they have 24 hours to fill on our TVs. But yeah. what do they do instead? They'll, you know, you can watch CNN for uh, six hours um, and hear about four stories. Like one will be like the, you know, the weather, the weather event of the day, the hurricane or the fire, and then three things Trump did today. And mm. then they'll have 10 people talking about their opinion about what that means. And I mean, you don't hear that much actual news. You just hear all this opinion and analysis. And I think that really is kind of rotting our collective brains. Uh, it's, you know, I call it junk news because it's like junk food, I you totally know, agree. junk food is like, it's food. It won't kill you right away, but it's not good for you to just sit there all day. And I, I feel like c consuming all the cable news is the information equivalent of eating uh, donuts and fries all day. Do you guys have a layer that looks at individual uh, reporters and then how they skew? You know, we so we don't categorize it by you know, journalists and reporters. And we do that purposely because you can get at the same thing that you're looking for by analyzing the content. So it's like grading the paper rather than grading the student. Because, you know, even somebody who's, you, you, you typically view them, like you may be familiar with a, a opinion writer in the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times and say, oh, this person is conservative or, oh, this person is liberal. But, you know, they may, a particular piece of work um, can't stand on its own and it may not necessarily take a hardline conservative or hardline liberal position that you would expect from that writer. So, yeah, you could, you know, look at their body of work over time and say, you know, 90% of this stuff leans left, um, but then, you know, this 10% is center or maybe even more conservative on this issue. And I think that's more instructive. Um, also, it's, you know, it's very, it gets very personal and, um, you know, people are more complex, you know, so just to, to label, to label them and put them in buckets, I would just invite more controversy anyways. Yeah, that's fair. Now I can see that being the, 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 the case where you, you reduce the value of what you do by doing that. And then what about, um, what about flipping this around and you guys creating your own news source, like saying, this is an aggregator of things that we find to be reliable, or here are the left leaning or right leaning things. Yeah. You know, there are lots of folks that are in that, the aggregation business and, um, and there are folks that you know, already rely on our chart is kind of a basis uh, for that. So we've got our work cut out for us to try to analyze all the content in the world. So we won't do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot. What about folks who are, you know, like, like in, in some ways, my show is a news outlet. You know, we definitely break news here and we give mm -hmm. ground truth to things that, you know, like I've got um, potentially have a very, very high placed person in the Kurdish government going to come on the show and mm -hmm. talk about Kurdistan, right? But I'm not a news wow. source. So mm -hmm. how, how does something like, I mean, because Tim Poole, I didn't see his name on there. He talks about the news all day long. What? How about people mm -hmm. like that, that are sort of tertiary sources? Yeah, so we focus on uh, you know some of the bigger ones. There are certainly uh, smaller outlets, smaller blogs that are um, that have made it on our chart uh, just because they, they do have some, um, you know, extensive Twitter followers or, uh, you know, Facebook pages and things like that. And so you can see that it easily gets into these kind of, uh, as you say, tertiary uh, sources. You know, our, the 
point of creating this taxonomy and methodology is so that ultimately we are, are, are able to rate any kind of content, um, any kind of uh, content that touches on news, but you can, especially political news, uh, people ask us to rate things like um, Rolling Stone and uh, Teen Vogue, uh, which you know certainly have uh, columns and content that are political, but most of it is directed towards um, you know music or fashion in those examples, right? Um, so we we can rate all we can rate all the content. Uh, we plan on rating as much of it as possible, uh, but we do want to focus on the on the things that people come to rely on as sources of news. Examples of that include things like like PragerU on YouTube, other you know, prominent YouTubers, sites on uh, your prominent Facebook pages uh, uh, people rely on for news. We want to be able to, uh, to rate all of those because like, people have a hard time distinguishing between what's reliable for news and what's not. Right. And that's the whole question that our chart answers. And so, especially on Facebook, where uh, lots of different sites will show up with that uh, news card. Like, you know what it looks like. It's very familiar. It's a familiar format. It's a picture. Mm -hmm. It's a it's the uh, title mm -hmm. uh, of the of the outlet. And it's the uh, the title of the article. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if it is um, you know, New York Times or truth-eagle.gun, right? That was a joke on SNL the other day. Um, they, uh, that was like a, it's not a real website, but they made a joke about that on, on SNL. Those show up as the same news card, you know? So if people can't distinguish that, that's the kind of stuff that we want to be able to distinguish. I mean, we can get into podcasts and radio shows and things like that. Anything that people rely on as a news source, uh, we don't rate it all yet, but we plan to. How does Saturday Night Live, how do they rate? They they have news of sorts, or is it all parody? All right. So, you know, satire and humor is a really interesting thing. Uh, and it is, so we've avoided it sort of purposely on our chart up to this point, to the extent that people rely on it for news, you know, I just said, you know, we want to rate everything that people sure. rely on for news. Uh, it would rank really low on our uh, on, on our scale, <laughs> uh, as would as would any you know humorous outlet, right? Right. And it's not that these are not valuable. You know, um, satire, comedy. You focus on you know, the political issues that of the day, speaking truth to power. You know, making fun of people who are in, are in power. Um, that's just a, a longstanding American tradition. It's a hallmark of democracy. It's super important. It's also very funny, right? But is it news? No. I think uh, even even Michael Che uh, on SNL said that a few weeks ago. He said that people would come up to him and say, oh, man, I, I rely on you to get all my news. And he says, don't do that. Because you shouldn't. It's very selective. I mean, they only cover a couple of things. Yeah. Same thing with the you know, Daily Show or Stephen Colbert. Like, you're not going to find out the day's news if you watch that. You'll find out some things that are going on, but it's certainly not sufficient. the The whole point of those things is to is to poke fun and to and to make you laugh. So there's going to be unfairness in there. Like you'll notice that here's the format of most comedy. Um, they'll say things like Mitch McConnell comma, some insult about Mitch McConnell, right. you know, to get a laugh and then move on to what he did. That's just the format of those things. So, you know, it's uh, as, as far as newsworthiness, you know, that's, a, that's pretty unfair, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so I guess in that sense, have you received any pushback from some of these news organizations that are not happy where they are on your chart? Yes. Ooh. I, I, I can't imagine... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can't imagine anybody's going to take it. Well, I'm not taking that lying down. We're we're going to do something about it or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> I've gotten some good complaints from both bottom corners of the chart, <laughs> which of is course. very flattering. Except the National Choir. I'm sure they're okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I haven't, I haven't heard from them. No, nope, we're but, okay. <laughs> yeah, so InfoWars, this is, this is just the highest form of flattery. The the very first chart I came out with, you know, Infowars has always, you know, been the bottom right dweller of my chart for for a good reason. Everybody kind of knows about them. You know, a couple of days later, they came out with their own chart, and the axes were something like 
freedom and tyranny <laughs> and like corporatist versus something else. Wow. Love and of course it. they were at the, the apex of whatever that that chart was. And there mm -hmm. are some other sources that are scattered. There was like eight other things. And then I think they gave up because, you know, charts are hard to make. So you know, they, uh, you know, they obviously I was a, a mainstream media propaganda machine or something of that sort. And that, but I've gotten, um, I've gotten complaints from uh, folks on the on the bottom left. You know, lots of Twitter rants. You know, their uh, defenders, uh, you know, coming after me, saying like, "You just don't get it. And this is this is funny." And uh, you know, or this guy is telling the truth, and he got this one story right this one time. You know, but I think the people that are in the bottom corners, they kind of know what they're doing. Yeah, and they're they're it's a business model. You right. know, they're taking taking advantage of people who are are gullible and they're monetizing it and i think that's wrong and so i don't i don't mind um in receiving their criticism i do appreciate the sources that i've heard from that are in the uh in the top of the chart that kind of want to understand why they're a little bit uh more left or right than you know they perceive themselves to be um and they kind of want to understand uh, the reason for their their ranking in comparison to others and you know that's useful because the, the media industry itself is uh, under uh, constant uh, pressure to change, and you know they have these competing pressures of, you know, putting out a, a good product, a, a good newsworthy, high quality journalism product, uh, and you know also having the challenges of making money in this evolving news industry. So you know they need to understand what uh, you know, how their content is perceived as well. Now, and then on the flip side of that, have you received any feedback of somebody who is maybe even somebody that that's helping you work on the chart that has either changed that this chart looking at is like, you know, I really need to change how I look at my news or it's changed their ideology that says, you know, based upon this, I've, I, I've went to the other side, I've looked at it and I said, I'm, and now I'm seeing things that I've, I've not seen before. Have you, have you gotten any feedback in, you know, pot more of a positive way? Like from my, from my analysts or, for or from anybody. people that, are, um, you know, I, I do get a lot of great feedback that is really gratifying to me. People tell me that, okay, now I just, uh, stick to sources that are in the green box. The green box would be like the top middle uh, section of my chart. And I think that's a, a positive outcome because, you know, they're, uh, they're purposely screening their, their own news feeds. At, and trying to be in less of an echo chamber. I've had other people that say, you know, I I purposely go to sites that I was not familiar with uh, before, and now I understand my political opponents better. Right. I think that so people don't tend to like admit readily when they change their mind or flip a side completely because there's just a lot of personal um, you know, ego, ego risk. Right. Yes, exactly. However, people, you know, when people say, oh, you can't change any, anybody's mind, that's absolutely false. Like these media sources and we as humans are in the business of changing other people's minds and influencing them all the time. Right. And so it's maybe a gradual thing that people change their minds over time. And, but how I see it manifest in the most uh, rewarding way is when people say that they now understand Understand and can have a conversation with somebody who's on the other side. Mm. I think that's the most critical thing that you can get the critical, wow. most critical benefit. Because if you understand, you know, if you understand what arguments somebody's going to make before they make them and why they think that way based on the news that they read, then it's, you know, when you first hear it come out of their mouth, you're not shocked or angry or upset. You just kind of know what, where they're coming from and you can address it. That's, it's kind of the effect social media has had is, you know, you see so many, you know, arguments on social media is because somebody puts something up inflammatory and it's just, you know, there's no really way to back it up or whatever. It's just like, what is this? This is garbage. I can't believe my friend is doing this. He must be crazy. He um, must be crazy. Yeah. But exactly. if he's, he, but your friend has read eight different things to say all the same thing. Right. And in his world, that's not crazy at all. Exactly. I mean, that's, it. you know, the, I, I've never, dropped it. I mean, I have s several folks that are on the different part of the spectrum that I am that, I, that I've kept. In fact, uh, uh, Pete and I know several of them together, but it's like I, I've only dropped folks that have just been 
it's not really what they've put out. They've just been belligerent. And mm -hmm. that's, and that's, that's different than putting out a story, but that's, you know, but again, that is, if I, if you take a look at where they're coming from, that's why I keep saying is like, if I had this as an Intel analyst, especially doing information warfare, this is such an invaluable tool to use this to evaluate sources as they're coming in, especially if I got to brief a commander or, or something like that is to be able to show the landscape. Like, and, and it's not just, I mean, this is primarily U S media. You could, you could mm -hmm. build this chart on foreign media. And that's really what the job of a lot of Intel folks is like, look, we need to get the entire landscape of, everything going on in the Middle mm -hmm. East, even non-English speaking stuff and, and place these on the same chart. So we have an understanding that, and we can brief this and show our math to the, to our commanders who have to make decisions based upon this. You, you're doing, you know, you're breaking ground by showing this model. Um, you know, and that's why I'm just, again, I'm just total fan on, 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 on this should get more coverage uh, in, in the mainstream media and also in the market space. No, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, we actually have um, individuals from across the um, you know, across the world who are trying to you know create these uh, charts for their own uh, countries, and it's totally possible. Um, you just need to you know set the left right uh, you know, the left right spectrum for this U.S. chart is you know unite the U.S. left right spectrum. So you need right. to reset it uh, for different uh, uh, different countries based on you know, people who are local and understand the local politics there. But it's absolutely possible. And right. yeah, I think that's uh, that has huge applications. You know, you you would, you can imagine the left right spectrum for France would look different from the left right spectrum in Saudi Arabia. And so, like, if you just put um, all those all these uh, individual country charts together, you could kind of layer them on top of each other um, and make this chart of charts for the world. Right. I mean, that's I mean, that's one of the, the again one of the reasons why it's important is you want to be able to to you know, you're going into different parts of the, of the world, especially with uh, with U.S. natural interest. And it's so great that I hate to say this, but it's so great that this is not an academic based chart because you made it simple enough to be recreated, which is, again, the the, the, the simplicity is in is in itself. It's, it, it's there's not a lot of thought process. So then therefore, it is much more easy. Uh, much easier to explain this to somebody who you have to brief instead of starting to go into formulas and, mm -hmm. and algorithms and things like that. And that that's again one of the beauties of it. Is I, I don't know how many times I've seen uh, you know studies from academics that say, "Hey, this is great. Can you use this?" And it's like, no. Why? Because I can't take the 1919 Armenian genocide, you know, the, this formula you came up to understand it and use that on any other thing in the world. This allows me to do that. Right. And, you know, people who want to understand uh, people who are interested in media bias and quality, um, you know, you can read you can read lots of really great papers on it. But the problem is that most people who need to know about media bias and quality the most are not going to be the folks that read those academic papers. Right. One of the things also with being Intel and reporting and how they work together, I can go on the same patrol as somebody else and see totally different realities. Mm -hmm. And so it's legitimate that you could have a reporter from publication X and one from publication Y, and they come back with a totally different experience, you know, based completely on their own observations, their analysis, whatever that's subject to review. But it's important that you're doing this because you can have look the whole situation in Syria and Kurdistan and Turkey and all that. That is so complex. All you can report is like the, the tip of a pin compared to like the, right. the global reality that that is because you know turkey has a say syria has a say the kurds have everybody has a say and, and you're trying to guess as to what's really happening on the ground it, it's just it's impossible mm -hmm. to cover in 500 words there's just no way to do it right yeah and that's uh that's the crazy part i mean when we uh try to you don't have to comment on syria because it's just so complex i, I can't imagine you guys you know want oh, to still deal unfolding with Say it again. It's still unfolding. I mean, yeah, it's, it's still unfolding, and there's just no there's no good answer. It's, it's hard tough, to analyze right. something that's it's like analyzing a, a point in a river. You right. know, it's just it's changing every instant. Right. Uh, what's mm -hmm. next for you guys over there? I mean, obviously you're growing. You've got this great product. What what's coming up the next year or two? Well, uh, like I said, we just launched our media software, uh, media literacy software platform uh, for educators, and we're, we're really hopeful that that. Um, it becomes a part of media literacy curriculums across the country. Uh, media literacy curriculums are not 
a very common thing. You know, there are uh, high schools and uh, colleges that are in process uh, it, developing these uh, types of courses because it is so important, but mostly it's uh, social studies and English language uh, teachers that are trying to incorporate it into their into their uh, curriculums right now because it's you know information literacy is just such an important part of being able to understand the world around you. You know, I, I feel like we're in this temporary moment where our ability as a society uh, to to spread information has temporarily outstripped our ability to process it. Yeah. Uh, and that's uh, okay. It's happened before in history, like with the printing press uh, and when radio came out and things like that. And we learned to adapt, right? And we, But we had to get smarter. And right now we're kind of functionally media illiterate as a society. Can't, can't tell what's left and right. Can't tell what's good and bad. You know, a huge, huge uh, chunk of the population. So we, I believe that, you know, because societies, entire societies have gone from illiterate to literate in just a span of a generation or two, because reading is taught, we can go from media illiterate to media literate in a generation, as long as we teach young people how to read the news. Mm. So that's a huge part of what we're up to right now. I really hope uh, that uh, people start using content, our content analysis strategy and methodology as just a you know, functional way of teaching uh, students how to evaluate content because they need to not just have examples of like, oh, here's a fake news story and here's a deep fake video. Uh, here's examples. This is why this is bad. They should be able to handle any kind of content that comes at them because then they'll truly be prepared. And, you know, can you imagine a, you know, having a society where there's just low demand for junk news? Like that's what it would actually change things, right? Yeah. <laughs> that would be great. Uh, you know, we, you know, we ultimately want to help Hey, there's a lot of different ways in which the analysis and the ranking of news can uh, impact society. I mean, you, you know, when, when Google first came out, uh, their, the basic idea was we're going to organize the world's information. Well, we're going to rate the world's news. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be a, a very obvious thing that this was needed. Uh, we, you know, when we look back five years from now, like, of course, we needed to rate the news and rank the news. So that's what that's what we're trying to do. And they're uh, are ways that you know, publishers themselves can can use that in kind of ranking information. Companies who advertise on news sources can use that information to make sure that they're supporting good journalism and avoiding uh, junk news and fake news and propaganda. So we hope to be able to uh, help all the stakeholders in good news media so we can get to that promised land of you know where there's just less fake news out there because none of us have an appetite for it. Yeah, please do that. Please accomplish that incredible goal. That would be fantastic. I'm working on it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Eric, any last questions? No, I think this is great. I'm I'm so happy to 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 you know to bring her to, to bring her to you and to, to get her on your show because this is the type of thing that needs more uh, exposure. I mean, quite honestly. That's right. And hopefully I have a vertical for you, Vanessa. It's um I pay a subscription each month and you put me on your chart. And then I throw a fit and then everybody's drawn to your chart and they're drawn to my show and we all benefit. <laughs> <laughs> we'll sell subscriptions to it. See, now she's going to be accused of that. So just. <laughs> <laughs> That's one business model. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no good. Well, listen, seriously. Uh, yeah. All kidding aside, I really do love what you're doing and, and I appreciate Eric bringing you in because I just this past week, I'm like, forget the damn news. None of it's any worth anything, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it, it is, it is worth doing. And you know, if you want to be on top of a story, you're going to have to do some work and read some stuff you don't want to read. And I appreciate you for guys for giving us our, our bell curve and, and right. helping to continue to get smarter on that so I can read news better. I'm just, I'm just happy to, to finally meet Vanessa. So that's great. <laughs> yeah, it's great to meet you too. <laughs> it was great talking to you guys. I, I really appreciate this uh, very in-depth conversation. Love talking about this stuff, and I'm glad you care about it uh, too. So thank you.